Well, good morning again. For those of you just joining us online or anybody that just happened to walk in, my name's Rick. I'm the uh, campus pastor here for Carl Junction, uh, St. Paul's United Methodist Church, and it is just a privilege and an honor to be able to be here this morning with you. <clears throat> if you're a guest with us today, we are really excited to see you, and if you have absolutely any questions or any needs whatsoever, please uh, grab somebody, talk to one of the uh, people here that's been coming a while, you you'll know them, just because they'll have a great big smile on their face and be willing to talk to you, just look for them, they'll be out there, I promise, right? I'll also be out there in the lobby after the service, just kind of wandering around, hoping somebody will come and talk to me, so please, if you're new, come and grab me, and I'd love to talk to you. Uh, I do like to schedule some lunches and some coffees and stuff with, with new folks, just to get to know them, maybe let you get to know me a little bit, and a little bit about the church, so I'll be looking forward to you taking me to lunch soon, but... Um, <laughs> Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so we have a mission at this church, and that mission is to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. How do we do that? We, we do that by loving like Jesus loved, all right? We want to um, love, love all people the same. So despite what you might think when you, when you come to, to a church service anywhere, not just here, but any church service, I know a lot of people are, are shopping and looking around for church homes, but I just want to remind you that, that this isn't some show you come to watch and then you go and have lunch and talk about what a great show. No, this, when you come to worship, you come to be a participant in worship. That's why we have you stand and we sing. Sometimes we actually clap and get excited about worship, you know? I don't know, maybe. Sometimes we need a drummer. We'll get the drums going. We'll get, a little, get it pumped up in here, right? But uh, it's, it's something that we participate in. We kind of share an energy. We all, have, we all have our own thoughts and dreams and prayers and questions. But as we come together on a Sunday morning, we, we have an opportunity to kind of create and share this energy together, all right? When we talk about our mission of leading people to an act of faith in Jesus, that starts right here. Every Sunday morning when you come in, we can be active in our worship together. So you don't have to wait to, to leave this building to have an act of faith. It starts right here. So like Jeremy said, today we're going to be wrapping up our series called Life Goals. What we hope to do with this series, I think this is the fifth week of this. This was a pretty decent uh, uh, length series, like five weeks long. But uh, in this series, we've been looking at what are some life goals? I mean, we started on, you know, the beginning of the year, and we wanted to, what are the life goals that people, you know, um, New Year's resolutions? I'm, I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but I would like, yeah, go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you have already broken your New Year's resolution? Yeah, yeah, some people are going like this. Okay, yeah, exactly. I just didn't make one this year. It was great. So, <laughs> but we wanted to figure out as Christians, what, what should we be about? What should we be about? What should our goals be? What sort of things should we be striving for? And many of us, as I look around the room, I, I've seen a lot of you for a long time. I've been at this church for going on 15 years now, even way back before we were with St. Paul's, and I remember some of you from there. But <clears throat> some of us have been going to church for a really long time. Some of us even longer than 15 years. You know, I talked about a guy that had been here like 80 years or something like that. I forget, oh, Bob. But he... It kind of grew up in church. So when we spend that much time in church, it's got to be for a reason, right? It's got to have some purpose, some point to it. So I believe that the church can and should be a relevant voice in our lives, not only in our lives, but out there in our communities, around the people that we come in contact with. And it's in church where we talk about stuff that we don't typically talk about at work or talk about around the water cooler, we, what we do is we talk about God. We talk about the mysteries of God. We talk about how God has come to give us life and to, to the fullest. We hear and, and talk about the hope of Jesus. And we talk about how Jesus' life meant that he came to bring us life. Life to the fullest. We talk about these things at church, and, and all of this helps us to find meaning in this experience that we are having together right here, right now, the church. And I believe the church then should be this powerful, life-giving voice in the way that we live, in the way that, that we set up our goals and objectives. Didn't realize how important church was, did you? Think it's like, oh, let's check in a box. I went to church on Sunday, right? 
It's way more than that. This is just the beginning where we come and we give praise back to God. So if you've missed any of this series, you can go to sp.church, and they have the the sermons loaded there, or you can go to our uh, St. Paul's Carl Junction, at St. Paul's Carl Junction, type that in your search bar, and that'll bring you to our uh, Carl Junction Facebook page, and we post it, and they'll be tagged. Uh, I think whatever he does, it, he makes it the very first thing you see on there. Scott does. He does a really good job with that. So Go back and watch all, all of them, and then there'll be a quiz at the end of the next month of what you watched. Okay, I'll have a test in here for you guys. So, I don't know if I should do this or not, but I'm going to anyway. Most, and I didn't, I didn't do it today. This is just a plain red shirt. I didn't go all Kansas City crazy, because last time I wore a jersey, they lost, so I didn't wear it. <laughs> but you guys do know that I'm a Chiefs fan, and, and I just have to mention one thing about last, last Sunday's game. Now, what the Chiefs did was quite amazing, and their fans thought so, so they decided, the fans, I guess, I've read about this, I didn't do it, but everybody donated like 13 bucks to a charity that Josh Allen was excited about. It's actually his mother, Patricia, or his grandmother, Patricia, uh, and then this money all goes to this hospital. Now, they raised um, over $400,000 last I checked. I checked it this morning. They've raised $400,000 of people donating 13 bucks at a time, and surely people have done more than that, but it was, you know, in remembrance of the stunning playoff game, right? Where the, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but they did win. They came back in 13 seconds, really? Come on. 42 to 36 overtime win. Of course, flip of coin. I'm not going to get into that. That's, that's the rules. That's how it works. All right, get over it. So... <clears throat> I shouldn't uh, wait till today. We'll see how it goes today. All right. <clears throat> so that may have been a little bit of a dig to, to, to the Bills. It was probably started out that way. I'm sure some smart aleck like, hey, let's send 13 bucks to his favorite charity. And then it kind of caught on. It's kind of this backhanded compliment kind of thing. Not very nice, probably. But they raised $400,000 so far. That's pretty amazing, I thought. So have you ever had somebody give you one of those kind of compliments that you know they weren't really complimenting you, right? Like, huh, nice shirt, nice sweater, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I get that, somebody, nice jacket. Yeah, I did it because I didn't want to tuck in my shirt. But, no. but they give you these compliments, and you know they're not being very sincere about it, right? We know this. Uh, maybe it's one of those compliments, and, and, and you've had them done to you or or there's stories where this happens all the time. Lots of people do it. I do it a lot, too. I'm kind of sarcastic, which is not a good, good thing. But it can even be a little bit more hurtful if, if you get some kind of backhanded compliment or, or something from someone from the church or the church. Because as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, we're supposed to be life-giving, right? We're supposed to be setting the example, so many people have stories like this. There are lots of, of cringeworthy stories of people that have been hurt by the church. Church is supposed to be this place that should be transformational, right? Church is supposed to be this life-giving thing that brings hope and love and forgiveness to people. So when we don't do that, it's really, really easy to notice it. You see it. So I believe that the church can do these things so much that we can do these things right that I've dedicated my whole life to this now. This is, I don't know if you know this or not, this is what I do for a living. I don't go anywhere else. Some of you will get phone calls from me and I'll even say, oh, you're working, sorry. I just call you in the middle of the day, right? Yeah, I need you to volunteer at Kids Space. No. But usually that's kind of how the conversation goes. Some of you are working over there now because I made that phone call. But <clears throat> you see, I believe that, that we are called to reach people. We're called to, to love people the way Christ loves people. So, what I think, and, and when I say I or we, I'm including me in these statements, sometimes we struggle to do that. It is really, really hard to love some people. And every time, as soon as I said that, you all went, mm-hmm, you sat right next to me. No, <laughs> no? right? It is really hard to, to, to love everybody, right? But sometimes we struggle to live out what we profess. We, you know, what, what, what we profess to be true about what we believe when it comes to Jesus and God and this whole church thing, right? It's not a religion, right? We're not, it's, all, it's not all about religion. It's about this relationship that we have with Jesus. And we are people of grace and hope and love and forgiveness. But it doesn't always come across that way, does it? 
the broader perception of our culture, in our culture about the church is this, is that, that the church is judgmental, non-accepting, hypocritical. And in some ways, that reputation can be unfair, but has by and large been earned over the years. I've heard of countless stories of people being harmed by the church and, and some people even kicked out of churches for not giving enough. I, I had a friend tell me that, that one of the churches they went to, that they actually asked them for their, their pay stubs so that they could see if they were given their 10%. I was going, to, okay, that's one way to do it, right? But they were kicked out for not giving enough. And then, then there's people who are kicked out because of their beliefs. And, and, and we talk about this a lot here, that you know, it's not about uniformity, right? It's about unity and mission. I understand all of you are from different backgrounds. I know that we all don't vote for the same people when it comes time to voting, right? Or I wouldn't be in, never mind. Um, <clears throat> but I understand that, but it's not about unity, it's about uniformity. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. It's not about uniformity, it's about unity in our mission with God. People kicked out of churches for their lifestyle. There's this research project by Barna in 2013, and this was a study done that, that people were self-identifying, right? They were checking the boxes of what they felt, how they were in church. And over half of them felt like they were most likely to be self-righteous rather than to be like Jesus, right? And we want to be in, I think it's the top right corner, is that what it is? I can't look at the picture. But that's where we want to strive to be. But if you notice, over, what was it, 51% or something like that is in the self-righteous category. Now, before you get too worried about this, and this shouldn't come as much as, as a surprise because we know who we are and we know we're humans, but we strive to be like Jesus. We try really, really hard to be like Jesus. And as much as I hope you think this, I'm not Jesus and neither are you. We are not God. We are not perfect. None of us are. No matter how much you think you are, you are not perfect. We are not Jesus. We have a really hard time, and we aren't very good at thinking like and living the way Jesus lived. It's hard to live a life transformed. It's hard to be a disciple of Jesus. And if you knew, if you knew how hard it was, you, you probably wouldn't sign up for it, right? A lot of people are like, oh, that's way too hard. But, and you knew there had to be a but coming, right? A big but. That doesn't mean we should stop trying to be like Jesus. That's what we're called to do. We need to be like Jesus. So we're going to be reading from Matthew today, chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. It's all about integrity. It's about faith. It's about honesty. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little, a little context. So Jesus has come back to Jerusalem. He's been traveling around doing his Jesus stuff, right? And he's coming back to Jerusalem, the center of the religious life in that area. And he shows up and he's going to go to the temple because that's what Jesus does. He goes to the temple and he likes to, he likes to hear what they're saying. And he also goes there to teach. As a rabbi, he's full of, of the Holy Spirit and he's coming to bring the word of God to the, to the people. Now, when Jesus shows up, it's usually a pretty good crowd around him, and, and, and it kind of causes some noise and some waves, and so much so that there's this group of people approach him while he's at the, the, um, in Jerusalem, and this group of scribes and Pharisees and politicians all show up to try and, and mess with Jesus, and they confront him. They're trying to mix politics and religion, and, and they're going to make some trouble and cause some waves, and, and they want to make some, some dissension between Jesus and his followers, and they want to try and trip him up, and they're trying to ask him these questions that, that really speak to Jesus' authority. They're kind of divisive questions about a controversial topic. And this group of men, they want to trap him in a contradiction. Now, they want to expose him in public and discredit his whole ministry. So they have an agenda when they come to ask these questions, okay? So let me read what, about one of these confrontations. <clears throat> this is Matthew 22, verse 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. 
You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they had heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. Now this trap was a challenge to Jesus' authority and his power. You see, the Pharisees, they, they felt like Jesus coming in and, and stirring up all this stuff and teaching. And a lot of times when he would teach, he would tell them that the Pharisees, you heard it this way from, from this group of people, but I tell you, this is what God meant by that. And this is what God says we need to do and how we need to do it. And here's the Pharisees, they, they built a life being a Pharisee, right? They're in control. They got lots of power and they don't want to lose this power. So they're trying to hold on to what power they have left. So that's why they're trying to do this. So they're using this new controversial, you know, Roman thing that they've come up with called taxes to trap Jesus. There's this group of zealots that they're kind of a a nationalistic Jewish group. And these guys are like, no way. We are not paying taxes to Caesar. We're not doing it because they believe that it's true and right to put God first. So everything that we have should go to God first. So that kind of puts them at odds, right? They didn't like this new form of oppression from the Roman government, and they try to revolt against the Roman government, these, these Jewish people. And I just picture them with like wooden swords or something, you know, or pitchforks out there. No, you're not taking our money. But of course, the Roman soldiers, they, they squash that pretty quick and pretty decisive. Like, no, that's not happening. So they know who's got the real power right now, at least they think. The Roman soldiers take this area over, but, but there's still anger and resentment about what's going on. Now, the zealots, they still didn't like it, and they complained about these taxes, even though they were benefiting from the taxes. Get this. I'm not paying it, but when I do pay it, this helps me out, because there's another group, the Herodians, that that are actually there that are paid by these taxes to protect the religious establishments in the area. See, Rome said, hey, as long as you pay taxes, you, you go bow down to whoever you want to. There was all kinds of religions going on. But the Herodians' job was to squash all this and make sure that these people just kept quiet and paid their taxes. So they're benefiting from this. I mean, the whole establishment was funded by the taxes. The Pharisees were kind of like, hey, if you take care of us by paying us taxes, we'll take care of you. We won't let people pick on you. This is all tied to King Herod. Now, Herod, obviously, he's he's a kind of this puppet king, right? The Romans are really in charge, but they still have a Jewish king over, over everybody. And guess who pays his, pays his salary? The taxes. And these tax collectors, that's why they get this really, really bad name because Rome was like, hey, here's how much we want. I don't care how much you take. Let's get it? So the tax collectors are like, oh, pay up, pay up, pay up. Okay, here's Rome. Put the rest in my pocket. So the tax collectors had, a, had a, a, a reason for people not to like them, okay? So anyway, they're taking all these taxes, so this puts them kind of at odds, right? Do we pay the taxes and be, you know, kind of in trouble with our religious leaders, or do we not pay the taxes and be at odds with the, as, and be considered dissenters of the Roman rule, which is not good either way? So they go to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, what do we need to do? Do we pay taxes or don't we pay taxes? What do you want? Jesus kind of wows them because he doesn't really give them an answer, but he kind of contextualizes God's word for them and their time and their place. And He knows living in Rome, he can see the benefits of the protection of the Romans, right? He can see the oppression of the Romans and how they go about getting taxes, but he reminds them all that they need to find balance in being a good citizen and fighting for what's right. Now, we can, we can revolt and we can voice our opinion to the government. We can say we disagree with this and we disagree with that, but that doesn't mean we're going to go kick in the door at City Hall and, and drag the mayor down the street, right? No, that's going way too far. Not the alderman, the mayor. Okay, No, I'm kidding. Right? But we, we got to find this balance between who we are and what we do 
And this is what Jesus is telling me. You find that balance. You do what is right, but you've got to remember that at the end of the day, God is first. God is first. Now, there's a whole bunch more in this scripture that we can unpack, but really to the point is this, of this passage is, along with the other scriptures that kind of surround it, I want you guys to go sit down and read Matthews, but it's, it's they, the Pharisees, were trying to be deceitful. They disliked Jesus so much that they wanted to steal back his power, discredit them, make him, make him give up the power and give it back to the Pharisees. I mean, think about this. Here's Jesus who's dining with tax collectors. Oh, my gosh. Right? Here's Jesus who's coming and talking to all the sinners. Who? Wow, who does that, right? Who goes out to the people who are lost and in need of Jesus? Who goes out and talks to people who don't know God? Who does that? And these outsiders, they included Roman soldiers. They included Gentiles, and that was even another, oh my gosh, Gentiles? Don't get me started on talking to Gentiles. And if you don't know, that's us, right? We're Gentiles, unless you're Jewish. I don't know, are you? Um, but Jesus, he, he brings back integrity, and he speaks of the integrity of God, and he's truthfully living out God's word. He came to correct the ways that we had corrupted God's message. Jesus came to promote life and love and good news to the poor, recovery of the sight to the blind. He came to set free the oppressed. That's what Jesus came to do. Jesus' integrity is true to God's mission, and it rubbed people the wrong way. Wow. I don't know how many of you have actually been overseas to different countries and, and, and things, but we got it pretty good here in America when it comes to church. We, we can, I'm not afraid of anybody kicking in the door telling me to shut up. Well, maybe sometimes. But we can preach and we can teach and we can talk about God all day long without any fear of oppression. But there are countries that that's not the case. There are countries where if you get caught with a Bible, they can cut your head off or will cut your head off still today. And there are still Christians in those countries fighting every day to be a disciple of Christ when they could go outside at any moment, get caught and killed for their belief. You walk around out here today and you say, I'm a Christian. Everybody's like, okay, sure you are. I've seen you at work, right? There's a joke there about the going to the liquor store, but I'm not going to do it, right? <laughs> you see, the Pharisees wanted to eliminate this common foe that they had, this, so to, this uh, thorn in their side, so to speak. And they keep pushing, and they keep pushing, and until eventually, what do they do? They put a crown of thorns on this foe's head. But Jesus, right in the midst of this, he calls them out on all of it. And after this exchange with them, Jesus kind of goes on this rant, the seven woes, I think it's called, and he calls them the hypocrites, right? You're a hypocrite. This is in Matthew uh, 23 and verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you clean out the, the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. It was way more about appearances and the outside of the cup than it was what's on the inside. And, and just so you know, he's not talking about doing your dishes. He's talking about us. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the scribes and how they're being hypocritical. Right? We talked a long time ago about how, the, how the, the Pharisees would dress, and they'd have these really big hats and the right uh, beads hanging off and the right stoles and the, and, the, and the law written on their hats and all this, and the bigger the hat, the better they were and how cool they were, right? But they were creating and writing laws that even them, the Pharisees themselves, couldn't keep up with. They couldn't even fulfill the law that they were expecting all of us to, to do. It's, what is it? Do what I say, not what I do. That's how these people are acting. It was more about the outside than the inside, and these hypocrites, they were actors and stage players. They were pretending. It was all for show. Now, when it comes to integrity, for us today, our life goal should, all, should be all about integrity. It should be about what is God about. Who is God? What does God want for my life? It's not looking or acting a certain way. It's kind of like me when I'm up here. I'm sucking my gut in. That's why I can't breathe all the time, 
Okay? <sighs> but it should be about embodying the characteristics of God. And for us, what did God do? He sent His Son to this earth to live a life of righteousness, to show us, to teach us exactly what that looks like. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to live a life and said, look at me. I'm right here. This is what God wants. This is how God expects you to act. We're supposed to embody the characteristics of Jesus down deep into our soul, not just on the tips of our tongue, not just when we're, oh, I'll pray for How many times do you type, I'll pray for you on Facebook and then just keep scrolling? You actually pray in that moment? I've been guilty of praying. Oh, wait, go back. You know what I mean? I've done it. It's easy to do. In the book of James, it tells us that we are to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And it goes on to say, because when you do that, you're fooling yourself. We are to be doers of the word. So what does that mean? We should be about holiness and righteousness and justice wrapped in grace. Wrapped in grace. Let me say that again. Because we're not perfect. There is not a single perfect person in this room, in this community, in this world. There's only been one that's ever walked this earth, and his name is Jesus. And he's the one that we need to be like. His motivations were pure, so our motivations need to be pure, and we need to have a clean heart. So, what do we do with this? What do we do with this information that Jesus said? Give to, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God. How can we live a life of integrity? First and for, foremost, I believe we need to be people of grace. Offer Grace first to yourself. Understand that we make mistakes. I've done horrible, horrible things in my life that I I regret and, and, and I feel ashamed of, right? I feel guilty for, but I know that, that God has forgiven me. And if God can forgive me, why can't I forgive myself? So be full of grace to yourself, but Also, let grace be the center, the core value of your life, that you are going to extend grace to all people, right? Not everybody is as smart as you, right? Not everybody understands God the way you do. Not everybody believes the way you do. But you know what? Jesus came and died and paid the price for them too. So we need to be, let grace be the center of us. So be graceful. Be forgiving. Another one is to reclaim the value of repentance. Repentance. I think a lot of times we, we, we you know, God, please forgive me, you know, and, but we forget the repent part. Repent is that 180, right? Turn around, turn away from sin. It should be our core value. We should, but, but, but I think we've, we've forgotten what that repentance means or what it looks like. We're to turn away from anything associated with sin, turn away from anything that is shameful. And instead, we need to celebrate what God has done in our lives. I've, I've told you many times, you know, I've even given you my testimony about my alcoholism and my addictions and things like that. I've told you how God has changed my life. And I talk to the students sometimes and I say, man, if I would have just got this 30 years ago, shoot, now it's 40 years ago, 45 years ago, well, maybe not 45, 40 years ago, had I made that decision then, how many more people would I have been able to speak to and share how God has changed my life? And maybe, just maybe, something I say will change their life, will get them to kind of consider Jesus and give, give Jesus that opening for the Holy Spirit to kind of work with them and nudge them in one way or another. So we need to turn away from our sins and, and remember that we have repented. It means we turn away. We don't do it anymore. 
Turn away from sin and turn to God and be willing to learn from our past mistakes. That's why I spent so much time at Celebrate Recovery and, and working with veterans and all of that because of all the stuff, the, the history that I had in, with, uh, with the military and the things that I know from that lifestyle and then the history that I had with addiction and drugs and alcohol and all these things gave me the ability to, to, to be real with them and explain to them how God changed my life. And be willing to learn and, and make it so much more than just empty words. Oh, we'll pray for you. Oh, that's hard. You know? You, you, you've, you've heard them. You've all had words said to you that are just kind of like, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. But when you mean it, when they know you mean it, when they know you care, it's one thing to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. But then, but there's got to be a change in behavior. That's what repentance is. Because if there's not a change in behavior, are we really sorry? Are we really repentant? That's not just true for, for us when we're asking God for our forgiveness. It has to be true for, for one another. So when I say I'm sorry to you for something I did, for something that I said, I need to mean it and not do it again. That doesn't mean if, if your husband or your wife is beating you one day and he just, oh, I'm sorry, does that mean it's Okay. Because just because he said sorry and then he does it again the next day or she does it again the next day? No, that's not real repentance. So, as we try to be better, better husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and friends, we got to, one, remember that we're not God. We're not Jesus. And what's true for us is also true for the church. And when the church hurts someone, the church needs to practice reconciliation, and forgiveness. And that's hard to do, right? Because a lot of times, we'll get people, people come to me, oh, my last church, they did this or did that, and I just left. Okay, I, I get that. But did you talk to the pastor? Did you talk to the people that hurt you? There's all kinds of stuff in Scripture that talks about how, you know, where two or more people will get together and say, hey, there's an issue. It's kind of intervention, right? We've talked about that before. It goes both ways. You need to talk. I, I love that, that, you know, to see our church grow and more people come, okay? But our goal is not just to swap people from church to church, okay? Our goal is to reach the lost. And, and if you're from another church, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about that, right? But what I'm saying, though, is, is there are no perfect churches, and, and, and I'm going to say something that's going to make you mad. I'm going to say something that you disagree with. But that means that if I'm wrong, I need to be able to admit it and change. And I'll say it from this stage to everybody if I'm wrong. It's never happened, but we'll get, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> All right. But we have to practice reconciliation and forgiveness and be willing to make the changes. We need to be willing to love like Jesus. So what else can we do to live a life of integrity? It's, it's, it's don't be a know-it-all. We've all done things in ignorance, and we've done stupid things, and we make mistakes, and, and, and we'll say something to somebody, we didn't realize we hurt their feelings, right? That, that doesn't mean that what you did was right or wasn't wrong, but it doesn't mean you have to fully, oh my God, and go to God and beg for forgiveness and repentance. Not everything is that kind of thing, but sometimes you need to be able to, to when someone hurts your feelings, step up and say, hey, whoa, whoa, where, where, where do you get off saying that? And maybe... Maybe say it a little nicer than that. I get a little snarky when, when people do it to me. But um, we're supposed to do things with good Christian love. Remember that. And then be willing to make adjustments. So when it comes to the controversy of the, of the Chiefs donating this money, it wasn't even the Chiefs. It was fans did it, right? So don't blame the Chiefs. They're not bad guys. But over $400,000 to Josh Allen's late grandmother, Patricia Allen's fund at this uh, O'Shea Children's Hospital in Buffalo. Good things come out of that, $400,000. That's great. But people got upset because it was a slight dig and it created this stir because, oh, $13. Why did they give $13? You know, they could have gave $20. They could have gave $100, whatever. And I'm sure people did. But as good Christians, loving people, as disciples of Jesus, do we really need to get all uptight about it? If we don't like it, don't give. Or maybe, maybe we give like a true Christian would, and, and donate whatever you can afford, right? Maybe you give 20 bucks, maybe you give 100 bucks. It, it, if you want to honor someone, do it. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that what they were doing was horrible and that they 
all of Chief's kingdom needs to be bowing down and praying today and for asking forgiveness. No. As Christians, we should be willing to make adjustments and change when needed. And lastly, I would say we need to care. We need to care for people. We need to care and let people know that God cares for them. And we need to be um, honest and, and upfront about the things that we care about. See, when, when, if you think about our time on this earth, we really don't, I mean, I know some of you, you're 70, 80 years old, and, and yes, that's a really, really long time for, for some of you, but in, I'm just teasing again, golly, when it comes to our time on earth, it's just a blink, right, when you compare that to eternity, so, so just relax. We should we should strive to not be so judgmental and hypocritical. We should value people, honor people, meet them where they're at, and be ready to admit our failures and admit when we're wrong. And be people who, who really do care. Because I, I think when, when you look outside at this world, they don't care what we believe in here. They really don't. For, for non-Christians, people who are nominal Christians, they don't care what we believe in. They care whether or not we care about them. They care if we care. You see, they want to see us as followers of Christ. This watching world wants to know, is the church willing to sacrifice for us? Because I've been reading this book, and it talks about how <laughs> there are so many charities in this world Every single one of us could, could Google something and find a million different charities out there. So, and here I am talking about offerings and giving and, you know, we should be tithing, stuff like that, right? But really the truth is, is I can do that anywhere. There are millions of good causes out there. Cancer research and autism and you name it, there's a cause. The question is, why should they give to this church? What is this church doing to change the world? What is this church doing to change the life of that student that doesn't have enough food to get home or doesn't have a coat or doesn't have clothes or, or whatever? What are we doing to change someone's life? There's a, a, a gentleman named Cody who graduated from our, our partner ministry, Ascent Recovery Program. And what that is is, a, is a, a program that helps people get back on their feet. See, Cody lived this life of addiction and, and struggle and he ended up in prison. And then when he went to prison, and he finally comes home, he gets into this program, and they help him get back on his feet. But he wasn't quite really sure about this program. And he gets there. When you get out of prison, he'd been in there long enough that he has nothing. The clothes on his back. And he walks into this program, and, and they, the first thing they do is they look at him, and they're like, do you have anything? No. And they're like, well, come here. And they open up this thing, and here's, here's a jacket. Here's some pants. Here's some underwear. Here's some socks. Here's some clothes. They're taking care of his basic needs. You're hungry? Here's some food, you're right? You can live in this program. We will feed you. We will clothe you. And it's then that he, they knew that they cared about him. Because if they didn't care about him, they wouldn't have done these things. And Cody said it was at that moment when they offered me clothes that he knew they cared. You see, St. Paul's as a church, St. Paul's campus, CJ campus, Joplin campus, we're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But we will try to do all the good we can in all the ways we can and all the every time we can. But inevitably, we're going to let someone down. So to live with integrity it sh and, and to show that we care, we have to be honest and be ready to, to repair any situations if needed, to do that uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. But we don't stop doing all the good that we can. To live with integrity as Christians is to live in God's truth, that God cares and he loves, and God will do anything to demonstrate that love for us. So what will you do as a disciple of Jesus? What will you do to willingly go out there and demonstrate God's love for people? We as Christians have a tall order, and we are to care for others as God cares for us. And for today... That's the good news. May you all continue to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So as the band gets ready, I, I want to pray for us. But I want you to think about that. 
<laughs> this whole message was not about offerings and givings and stuff like that, but it's about integrity. Doing the right thing even when no one is watching. I love that saying, and I've said that to so many uh, junior recruits and things like that in the military. I've said that to people at work. But we know as disciples of Christ that, that God is always watching and that he blesses those who bless others. So just live a life of integrity. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It says in Scripture, we don't even have to swear. Or, you know, I don't promise to do anything. But if you do, if you say yes to something, do it. Go out in this world and, and make a difference. Change someone's lives. Go Chiefs. Just kidding. Let's pray. Gracious God, we just want to come to you this afternoon, this morning, and, and I give you all the praise and all the glory. Open our hearts and minds that we may see the opportunities to serve you, not just today, but every day. And God, most of all, give us the courage to love like Jesus loved. We ask this all in your son's most holy name. Amen.